Carpeting the mountains of the Pacific Northwest are the dense forests of cedar and fir trees with twisting devil's club, enormous ferns, and pine needles filling the forest floor. Hiding among these trees is an elusive cryptid who, like its cousin in West Virginia, is said to be the harbinger of doom, the Bat Squatch. Tonight we cover Bat Squatch, a funny cryptid with a beer named after it, plus other stories from Jen and Christina. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful episode of this Hometown Haunts podcast. I'm your host, Kat Cloco. Along with me on this exploration into the strangest spooky are my friends Jen Kohler and Christina Wald. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hope you're doing well. You can stay up to date with our show following us at, at Cincy Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram and join our Facebook group, Hometown Haunts. Of course, we're dying to hear about your personal encounters with the paranormal and fringe history from your neck of the woods. Send it to hometownhauntedmail at gmail.com or join and share it on our Facebook group, Hometown Haunts. And you can find our podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify and watch our show feed on YouTube. Just find us by searching for the Hometown Haunts podcast. Please take a moment to rate and review this show so others... Spooky lovers just like yourself can find us on all those other lovely platforms. And of course, the link is in the show notes. And we're switching things up a little bit this season. This is season four. Wow, it's been four years already. Um, I think we're doing it by year, aren't we? <laughs> some some podcasts do it by like half years. So anyway. I think we started it in January. So this is, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. We're close. We're like... 3.75 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh we're presenting shorter stories this time so we have variety and so we can all keep our ears perked and learn all sorts of strange and wonderful things so we have some show announcements so friday october 13th which is this friday uh my post-apocalyptic monster comic spiritus maximus returns after a four-year hiatus so wow on october 14th uh, the following day, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., there is Ghost Stories and a Haunted Walk with Christina and Jen. Yay! Hurrah! That will be at the Canard Nature Nook up in, was it Centerville, Ohio? It's the yep. same place we did, or no, not the same place. Similar close. to what we did last year. Very close. Same but park. indoors, system. because it's supposed to be very cold, I think. Ooh! Yay! Set the I mood. Know. So yes, yeah, inside the nature nook and there's still, you can, um, it's free, but they do request reservations just so they know how many people to expect. And then October 28th, uh, there is the hometown haunts live at the lane library and I'll be calling into the show and we'll be, it's basically a live version of this podcast with an audience. It'll be crazy. <laughs> That'll be really fun. That will be very fun. And costumes are apparently involved now. And I oh. have one. I have a costume. Uh, I, wear it. I, I, I don't have one. I have a hat and I will uh, maybe get oh, some sort of cool dress thing to wear. Oh, that sounds fun. And then in 2024, <laughs> there is the second annual Frogman Festival in Loveland, Ohio. And you can find out more information about that at frogmanfestival.org. It will be on March 2nd. So, everyone doing well today? This week? All mm -hmm. right? So far. I hear it's chilly in Cincinnati. I it's mean... been perfect. It was oh. so, it's been so nice since it's cooled down. And that's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, I was at the Renaissance Fair yesterday, and um, it was, I don't think I've ever seen a place so packed. I mean, mm -hmm. when you would look down one of the roads where they have, like, restaurants and you know, the little booths, like it was, there were no empty spots. It oh, was yeah. all people. It was a sea of people. But yeah. We managed to find a nice little place to, you know, it, it seemed like a place that would be pretty, but it, there weren't that many people there. It was right between where they were doing the jousting and the big pirate ship. There was like this big lawn area that was perfect for us to sit there and it wasn't that crowded. 
Oh, wow. Next. I heard that they set records this past weekend with attendance. Wow. I know that's I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be surprised at all mm -hmm. because it really was. I heard that they even had to close the parking lot or something like mm -hmm. the parking lot totally filled. Yeah. So I'm glad that we got there when it opened. It took yeah. like three hours for some people to get out when they wanted to leave. Oh really? God. Oh, thank yeah. goodness. It didn't take us that long and we left. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That sounds terrible. It's like. You leave for a day of fun and sit in your car for three hours. That sounds miserable. I just get out and go back in. Well, I think it's become such a huge event that the roads around it are very rural and they're mm -hmm. not meant to, you know, have hundreds of cars driving on them yeah. when they're leaving. I mean, even in the morning when we got there off and on 71, there were long lines of cars waiting to get onto the road that leads to the little road that leads to the mm -hmm. event space so it's not designed to i mean imagine the amount of people that come to king's island for a day but no roads uh, <laughs> no no yeah. not gonna work yeah just, there's no they don't have multi lanes or anything to get in no. really so it's just I think it was because it was a nice day because last year I went and it was in the 80s and a friend lent me a costume. It was really nice. We went on pirate day and so she gave me a corset and the whole get up mm -hmm. and it was probably close to 90 degrees or over. Oh, and gosh. unfortunately I brought a, brought a backup outfit to switch into because I've never been that warm. I mean, it was plus the corset and everything. It was mm -hmm. too much to bear. So yeah. I was in shorts and a t-shirt by noon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm the person who would show up in a Doctor Who outfit <laughs> pretending that I've teleported there. I'm sure that's there's awesome. other people who've done that. Oh, there is everything there. There was even yeah. a robot costume that was pretty okay. wild. There was, it, was, it was a weird sort of robot costume with a Viking hat. <laughs> because it was Viking right. weekend, and then you know why not? Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> it works. Yeah, I mean there is. You know what I noticed was really popular is this whole, and I like it. I mean, it is this whole mushroom motif, mm -hmm. like the the fungi sort of aesthetic is super in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should see my backyard. It's you oh, have those the rainy season. Huge. Yes. Oh, that was cool. that's because I'm using a. a the macro lens okay. making them look really big okay. but uh they're some of them are pretty big one of them is about eight inches in diameter that's going to oh, be wow. the fat jack mm -hmm. and we're talking about mushrooms everyone um it's it, <laughs> i have a wide variety of different fungi growing in my backyard now that it is the rainy season and uh, <laughs> the dogs don't destroy them that quickly so there's a bunch of different types um there's Fat jacks, like I said, those are really wide. Uh, those are the orange ones. And then there's um, a, a red cracked mushroom that is it, cool. It's a, it has a brown top, but the red is cracked through it. And oh, neat. Oh, That's it, neat. it looks cool. kind of like lava almost, Ooh. like a lava form going over, but it's a mushroom. So those are the two that are, um, and, oh yeah, and the Zeller's mushroom. That's the other one that's kind of yellowy. So... It's That's interesting cool. seeing the type of flora and fauna that is very different than anything mm -hmm. east of the Rockies. Yeah. Little guy did walk up to me and looked at the fern and goes, Mom, what's this? And I'm like, oh, child, you don't know what a fern is? I have failed you as a gardening mom. Like, so now he knows what a fern is. And That's I, good. Cool. Yeah. I so, mean, it, it, he's learning about a whole new ecosystem. Yeah, really, he is. Mountains but, and wa and ocean. I mean, he's close to all those things that Ohio is not close to yet. That's true. And um, squirrels are the same. Well, they're I'm joking, you know. but there's a lot of squirrels. So <laughs> and bears. Well, that's okay. This is Squirrel Appreciation Month. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> oh, there was a hashtag. Maybe it's a kid lit thing. I don't know, but they said it's Squirrel Appreciation Month. Oh. oh. Yay, squirrels. Well, in supernatural terms, squirrel is uh, Dean Winchester. Thank you. Oh, yeah? Yes. What? Their their nicknames are uh, Moose, Moose and Squirrel. Oh. Oh, that's hilarious. Or maybe it's Jens, It's Jensen. I think it's, they call Jared Cadillac. So it's like Rocky and Bullwinkle? Yeah. 
Because oh, he's so Jared's so tall and I don't oh, know that's why hilarious. Oh. Jensen squirrel, but that's well, really that funny. Makes sense. Yeah, who's the squirrel? The old cartoon. Yeah, that's really funny. <laughs> it's not where I would expect a reference, but it works. I get it. Yes, yes. I, I've really not seen the show, and yet I get it. Yes. yes. So, <laughs> all right. So, on on to supernatural things. Shall I introduce you to Bat Squatch? Yes, yeah, I, I hope you see. You've got that ring door thing, so maybe you will see one. Yep, yeah, maybe. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, so tonight's sources for my my segment of the show is the Cryptid Wiki, Untapped.com, Oregon Live, WashingtonBigfoot.com, Portland Ghost Tours, the new uh, the News Tribune from Tacoma, Washington. So Unlike other cryptids that have been talked about for generations and have a lengthy oral history, bat squatch is very recent. As sightings of bat squatch have been reported since 1980 and the eruption of Mount St. Helens in Scamina County, Washington. Bat squatch is described to be nine foot tall, ape like, bipedal, and a creature who sports a massive pair of leathery bat wings sprouting from its back that span approximately 50 feet. I sound like I'm reading a Tinder profile. Anyway, its body is covered in short blue hair and is described to have yellow eyes, the muzzle of a dog or a wolf, and the feet of a chicken. Yes. It is similar in appearance to the a hole in Orang Bati of Indonesia. It also is said to have a telekinetic power able to affect objects such as car engines, radios, and television sets. The first sighting of bat squatch was soon after Mount St. Helens erupted in May of 1980. Local legend has it that cryptid that the cryptid awoke that day. Bef- that sorry, <laughs> there's so much stuff it makes me giggle and then I lose track. Anyway, I'm going to try that again. The first sighting of bat squatch was soon after Mount St. Helens erupted in May of 1980. Local legend has it that the cryptid awoke that day before May 18th, 1980. Mount St. Helens had not erupted for over 140 years. For two months after the eruption, the region was shaken by aftershocks and steam eruptions, which are pretty scary things. Like, just imagine you're just driving down the road and then a fissure opens up and is just full of steam. So we have to, like, immediately stop your car so you don't fall into it and basically melt to death. That is pretty scary. So... Around this time, the first eyewitnesses of Bat Squatch started to pop up, making seeing the cri- making seeing the cryptid flying in the sky an omen of bad luck, much like the Mothman, its cousin in West Virginia. The aftermath of the eruption resulted in 57 deaths, uh, more than 200 houses destroyed, 47 bridges destroyed, 15 miles of road, and 185 miles of highway were erased from the landscape only to be shortly followed by an economic disaster to the entire area. So bad luck was indeed everywhere and remained for a while. And so Bat Squatch basically stayed in local oral history for the next few, for about a decade. Uh, So locals in the area warned their kids and curious onlookers to the area that Bat Squatch was roaming around the blast area at night and that it was super dangerous to go out there. May you be attacked by him or carried off. So in 1994, we have the Canfield incident, which was really fascinating to read about and went ways that I didn't expect. So as the encounter goes, it was around 9.30 on Saturday night when Brian Canfield, who was 18 at the time, was driving his pickup truck in Washington's Pierce County. This is the same county where Mount Rainier and Tacoma, Washington are located and roughly 90 miles north of St. Helens. He was driving from Buckley to a small isolated settlement called Camp One at the foothills of Mount Rainier, just north of Lake Coppeswin. According to Canfield, his truck suddenly stalled after he had just passed through a forested area and driven into a clear-cut farm field. When it came to a halt, he just sat there wondering what to do next when he first saw the massive talons descend from the sky and then the large creature landed in front of his truck. As he was quoted saying, it was just standing 
standing there staring at me like it was resting, like it didn't know what to think, Camtel says in a 1994 News Tribune article by C.R. Roberts. I was scared. It raised the hair on me. I didn't feel threatened. I just felt out of place, which is a really interesting comment. Roberts, the author and interviewer of this article, goes on to say uh, that Canfield is no fan of heavy metal music. He's never played Dungeons and Dragons, and he's never seen a UFO. Which I'm like, wow, those are dog whistles from the mid-90s about scary things that parents need to to watch out for, for their kids to fall into the satanic panic and other fringe things. Or if you're familiar with fantastical things you would yeah. be able to make up a story well yes there's that but definitely dungeons and dragons was warned about for yeah. parents to be having their kids not to be playing Metallica. and there's that tom hanks movie and all that oh yes yes so oh, it, yeah it, it's hearing him write that i'm like now looking at this decades later that's quite a dog whistle to be writing mm-hmm. and publishing in an article but I'm editorializing here. I'll get back to you. Yes. So the encounter, uh, according to Canfield, lasted only a couple of minutes before the bat squatch flew away. It turned its head and looked back at me and started flapping its wings. Then it slowly rose. The wings reportedly were so powerful that it rocked the truck with its turbulence. When bat squatch flew away, it was towards Mount Rainier. After the cryptid was gone, his truck started up again and he was able to go. He drove home and woke up his parents. He told them to get up and grab a camera and a gun. I could tell something was wrong the way he ran in, said Sandra, Canfield's mother. He was shaking. His mouth was dry. He was pale and his hair was standing on end, she said to Roberts in an interview. Together with a neighbor who knew the woods around Buckley, they are Bucky. They searched for the creature but found no trace of it. Canfield and his friends came up with the term bat squatch at school like the following day, and it was one of his friends who drew the first rendering of the creature. However, it was not his friend that drew the rendering that I included in our outline. That one is by the News Tribune Illustration, a sketch by David Keeley. Keeley. Keeley? Keeley. Dave Keeley. And I, I love how big the biceps are and how small the head is. <laughs> on this illustration i don't know if you can see it or looked at it before but has massive talons and really thick thighs and it's hairy so hairy proportion is everything (laughs) i'm trying to find it in the i will say dave's bug how he signs his name is great though i was looking at that like that's a well-balanced bug when i saw that drawing you know, it, it just seemed very typical of, you know. <laughs> it looks like very, high school to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was very ambitious. I love its head, actually. I love the design yes. of the head. Why we we will be so putting tiny, a photo though? of this up on our Instagram so that people can see what we're talking about. Um, so you can just look it up while you're listening to the podcast. So but I guess a tiny head is a bat head. I Beth guess. Has tiny head. I like the tufts on its ears as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. He doesn't look scary. The no, not scary. really. He looks like he needs a tummy rub. Yeah. 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 Scratching the ear. I'm not he really into this tick-a-bide. stuff, says Canfield. It boggles my mind really hardcore. I really can't explain it. It's weird. Definitely weird. I don't like it. Usually stuff like this happens to someone else. And that's what Canfield said. And I'm like, wow. Okay. <laughs> the really hardcore really struck me as a mid nineties saying too. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right. You're so this hardcore, man. Is... Hmm? You're so hardcore, man. Yeah, so hardcore. <laughs> yes. So this encounter, the original one reported in the news tribune, is completely different from the story that Kenfield is credited on talking about and being circulated online. If you read any other thing about this, including in the cryptid wiki, it gives you a completely different origin story. And I Hmm. found that bit fascinating because it's not hard to find the News Tribune article. So the this is what the Internet encounter is. 
According to the encounter, Canfield's truck suddenly stalled when he went to the engine to sort it out. So he walked around outside to the truck, popped up the hood, looked into the engine, and it was at that time Bat Squatch landed on the roof of his truck, making it shake and buckle under the weight of a large object. Canfield looked up from behind the hood of his truck to see the enormous Bat Squatch looming down over him from the top of his truck, ready to fight him. Canfield booked it back to town after a Talon swiped his shirt, reportedly tearing it, and reported what he had countered to the locals. So if you look online, that is the encounter that gets circulated, even though that goes completely contrary to what Canfield is quoted in this article saying. That's so I found exciting. that an interesting change uh, that it's I'm going to say that was amped up for dramatic purposes oh. and that the newspaper was the original true yeah. account. True. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, uh, Roberts interviewed Canfield and his family only a day or two after the incident happened, mm -hmm. because as he goes on to say in the article, his he learned about it from his neighbor, who was the Canfield's neighbor, and interested, he immediately interviewed them in their camper. So uh, it was just like, wow, that's very local and fast. I'm impressed. But. The report, however, did receive backlash from locals. Boy, howdy did it. In one letter to the editor dated May 1st, 1994, which is a week later, Ron Pazzini writes, Why didn't the News Tribune contact a skeptical investigator in cryptozoology who may have pointed out that a huge nine-foot mammal with wings would never be able to achieve the power to weight ratio required for flight and how improbable it is that such a creature would have gone undetected for so long. Sites and artifacts of similar creatures, including Bigfoot, have turned out to be hoaxes or mistaken identity. The senior goes on to point out that the story relies on human memory, which is notoriously unreliable, and are subject to the person reporting the story. He believes that Canfield did experience something out there, but goes on to say people do have anomalous experiences, but paranormal explanations are not the best option, given such a lack of hard evidence. There are multiple letters to the editor. Some really roast Roberts and Canfield for coming forward with this story. Uh, one of them, this one is my favorite title, Keep Bat Squatch Believer Off Science Beat. And that one is from <laughs> June 18th, 1994. And that that particular writer roasts them. And, this is uh, bringing back uh, newsroom memories for me. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> you're getting flashbacks right now. <laughs> Not, let, let's just say the people did not take this story seriously. People giggled about it and it faded from memory for a while. Until? Until 1998. Dun, dun, dun. So four years later. It was reported that an anonymous trucker hauling logs in Northern Oregon hit Bat Squatch. Oh, hit Bat Squatch. Ooh. It contradicted Canfield's story, however, reporting that the creature was 15 foot tall had tiny wings and a purple nose. So big nose, little nose, just purple. just a purple nose. Mm. So uh it have yellow spots too. That that yeah and that pom-poms for ears. Yeah, it, it kind of <laughs> sounds like he hit Muzzy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but you hit a Muppet. Yeah, maybe a Muppet. <laughs> this one is also not a certified report. It's just one of those online oral um, reposts, basically, that people lump in with the rest of this. So in 2009, there's the Mount Shasta sighting. So 15 years after the original sighting was reported, hikers climbing up Mount Shasta in California reported seeing a huge creature with leathery wings fly out of a crevice in the mountain. At first, the hikers said it looked like a pterodactyl or a pterodactyl. Wow. Been around a small kid for a while, a pterodactyl. But on further thought, it had the face that resembled a flying fox bat. In 2011, someone was walking in their yard after the dog and reported, I saw something fly in the sky. It had bat wings, blue fur, and had a face similar to, similar to something and glowing red eyes. It was about nine feet tall at the at least. After I watched it, it just flew away. 
All right then. So not well. That one has a pseudonym that it goes with. But uh, 2014, we have the final account of Bat Squatch, Bat Squatch being sighted thousands of miles away from the Timberline Mountains of the Pacific Northwest and all the way into the flat farmland of exotic Akron, Ohio. Yeah. On April 14th, 2014, at Archbishop Hoban High School, it's a real high school, I looked it up, it was reported from the second period Spanish class that a large black mass zipped by the window at a high speed. The class claims that the creature was nine feet tall with a 20 to 30 foot wingspan. I'm like, that's oddly specific. I I think it's creepypasta, but it's oddly yeah. specific. So uh, current did- that squatch. Hmm? I was going to say, did the teacher see it? <laughs> right. Um, so current Bat Squatch. You can find your own Bat Squatch year-round. In fact, I have a Bat Squatch here with me right now. Would you like to see it? Yes. Yes, All please. Right. Bat Squatch. Ooh, hoo, hoo. Uh, now that drawing I like. Yeah, that's yes. a cool Bat Squatch. He looks like now he'll that, eat That you. has a D&D vibe to it, actually. Uh-huh. It does, doesn't it? I love it. So How's it taste? Get- Bat Squatch yes. year round wherever rogue ales are sold. This is not sponsored at all. From the brewer, while there are many tales of Bat Squatch, there are all a bit hazy on the details, which makes the truth a juicy mystery. So, this uh-huh. uh, is a hazy India pale ale made by uh, rogue ales out of Oregon. And at the very top, it says, dedicated to a legend. And I'm like, yes. I, I right believe on. so. And yes, I did taste a half can earlier tonight. It is a very good fruity pale ale. Please drink and drive responsibly. I'm not supporting alcoholism at all. I'm just mentioning this exists. So there haven't been any reported sightings of Bat Squatch in recent years, 2014 being the last. The mid 90s saw a lot of reported angels, UFOs, and cryptid sightings in media. Actually, a linguistic anthropologist, William R. Seberg, a professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington, had a theory, and he actually wrote about it in one of the responses about Bad Squatch, uh, published in the San Francisco Bug, I think is what it was. It seems to me, and he writes, it seems to me that for some people, it's important to create a non-human entity. It's a boundary setting. It helps to find being human. He goes on to explain the massive amount of reports in media. We're approaching 2000 or the year 2000. So we'll see more stuff in the news about the end of time and of the world. So the time when these reports were being made, and I'm, I bet you two can remember this as well. uh, They're, it was during a big recovery time for the Pacific Northwest economically after St. Helens basically blasted so much of the region. It affected so much. Like, as I mentioned, people died. A lot of people died. A lot of neighborhoods and towns were decimated, as well as the infrastructure, that the logistical infrastructure of the area. So that impacted everyone that lived here. And then also we just had like an economical bubble burst the in the United States and worldwide. We had the Y2K and all the paranoia with that, as well as the um, dot-com boom of the late 90s. All this happening all at the same time, people created Bat Squatch as a very interesting familiar, basically, to liven up the area. But at the same time, during its heyday in the 80s, it had a completely different role where it was basically a boogeyman to keep the kids and looky-loos out of the area while they were recovering, saying, oh, Bat Squatch is going to get you. It's going to pick you up and take you away. Well, no, what will happen is you'll probably fall into a crevice and die and you'll never be found. That's so terrifying. It is. And so they came up with Bat Squatch as a fun way to kind of deter people because it's way easier to get people to listen to you with humor than it is with dire warnings. Yeah, And uh, so I think that's really what the role of Bat Squatch has been. It is a much beloved cryptid now, and uh, I enjoy it being around. And now I can drink it. 
That's awesome. <laughs> I, I saw the video when we were in Washington, I forget what year it was, of Mount St. Helen, because it's the famous video that the guy that took it died. Like it was oh, no. like mm -hmm. you see it blow up and then eventually all you see is ash smoke in it. Mm -hmm. And the person who filmed it didn't survive. How'd they mm -hmm. get the footage? Uh, they found it. I mean, they found this camera. Found later. The camera survived. I think yeah, the camera survived. Watch. Just the guys shooting the footage did not. Yeah. Um, you know, and I mean, you look at Mount St. Helen, you see that the whole top is gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were just look looking at it when we were in Portland. If you, that's how you could identify it over like Mount Hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have to say, I'm not then I wasn't really paying attention to world events. You know, I was in college and just basically in my own little bubble. So I wasn't really aware of what was going on in that part of the country. I mean, I had heard of the volcano erupting, mm -hmm. but beyond that. What year did the volcano erupt? It erupted May 18th, 1980. Okay. Yes, oh, wow. I thought so. I, I remember it happening, um, you know, because it was in the news. Uh, right. But obviously, you know, I mean, it was it was a pretty big disaster. I've seen yeah. historical film footage of it. I was not alive when it. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, that's what the footage you saw might have been that guy's. Like, oh, yeah, it was. The, yeah. That, that didn't, you know, he's some photographer or whatever. But it, it's, you know, one of the bigger disasters. Now, they keep saying that Old Faithful is over a giant caldera. Mm -hmm. oh, no. And saying that that will blow out half of the U.S. one day, and I get to be a part of it. Well, oh, I think I all of us would. Open, if it, if it... <laughs> I forgot to open the show. We had an earthquake last night. No, oh, yes, yes. I heard we that had there's a been a bunch. Four point two at seven twenty one p.m. Pacific time. And you felt it. It was so soft. Mm. We didn't even notice it while eating dinner. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So uh, on on the note of Mount of. Uh, Old, old faithful yes the, there was a earthquake oh, here scary. Scary, scary, scary. and actually old faithful's gotten really not so faithful anymore no oh really <laughs> yeah it doesn't it doesn't um go off it, it seems to be like i don't i don't know if what the standard is that it's off but last time i went there a couple of years ago i think it was 2019 it was maybe 45 minutes to an hour later than it was supposed to be Oh. oh, so Old Faithful it, is going to go whenever they feel like it. Yeah. Well, hopefully it won't go go and like become. Yeah. No. We, a we giant explosion. That. And yeah. if if the caldera does go, then um, most I mean most people in the U.S. will go pretty quick. I mean it would it would be a giant explosion. It will be the end times for sure. It would be like a, It will be a Just Vesuvius know that I will style. be dying in a hot mud bath. Hey, as long as it's quick. And I don't know what's happening. Thank you. That's true. <laughs> I, I'm not doing someday. any of this buried under the rubble stuff. I'll be surrounded by my dogs. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And that squatch. Maybe that will have a herd of them coming out. What would it be? A herd of bass squatches? Like, I mean, do, are any of these a flock of bat squatches? What What is the multiple for a bat? What's hmm, a counter? I don't know. I mean, because there are lots of bats in groups. Uh, you know, I'm going to look that up. Is it a colony? A colony, a colony flock, yeah. camp, or cloud. Mm. Cloud. So there's like four flock different of things. Bat squatches. A flock of bat squatches. <laughs> What is the biggest bat? Is Although a like camp a, seems more a, a camp, a camp though that kind of sounds more like they're camping out here, and there's a lot of people that camp out here. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That's true. It seems like that's the I could see a lot of the van life stuff happening there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the I think that, bats are cute. Oh, they're, they're so like adorable. Little dogs with wings. Well, especially where you were talking about the flying foxes. They're really pretty. Mm -hmm. They kind of look like lemurs to me. Aww. Which, actually, bats have more in common with primates than they do with rats. But for some reason, mm -hmm. people often say they're flying rats. But that's actually not true at all. Right. It's mm -hmm. just the amount of disease that they carry. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question, Jen, you asked, what is the largest bat in the world? Yeah. 
That is the giant golden crowned flying fox. Wow. It has a wingspan okay. of more than five feet long and is the heaviest bat recorded, weighing oh, up wow. to three pounds. Aww. And they're very they're very pretty. Like all the big the, but light. Yes. Big, big but light, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh let's see. They are wing. from the Philippines. Yeah, I think the 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 brown flying foxes are in maybe um, South America. I think is where they're indigenous to. There's a bat festival know. we used to go to that had a really pretty flying fox that mm -hmm. um, they'd rescued, and I think it was missing a wing or something. Oh and wow, that's a to... major component missing. Yes, yeah, yeah. so he couldn't fly anymore, and Poor but thing. he was. They would bring him to the festival and sort of kind of like at the zoo where they have animals out and I think mm -hmm. did they let people I don't know if they let people touch them um but generally but, bats don't like being touched by multiple people I would think most things don't like being touched no. by multiple people no, no. I but, <laughs> was at the zoo it was one of the festival of lights years ago and there was a a zoo person carrying around a skunk yeah, and I, I asked if I could pet it, and she's like, "No." I'm like, "Well, well that's just mean." <laughs> Why do you it's have so, it there in grouping it's distance? So fluffy, I want to pet it. <laughs> yeah, but they have a rather nasty bite. Yeah, yeah. Well, this one seemed pretty cool. I mean, I know people can can keep skunks skunks mm -hmm. as pets. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to pet it. It was so fluffy. No. But All I respected right. it. I, I didn't push the issue. So, exactly. Now, now I'm interested on a completely different note. The haunted attractions in Ohio. Yes. Haunted attractions in Ohio. Okay. It's gonna make you want to come back. You know, <laughs> leave the the land of bat squatches and bears. <laughs> bat squatches and bears. Oh my. Um. <laughs> I want that to come more. That oh, cat. You got to do a bat squatch for uh, cryptid. Yeah, Welcome you should do a oh, okay. Uh, oh, I'll I'll try to since it has Ohio connections now. Okay. Yes, true. Yeah. All right. So attractions okay, in Ohio. Haunted attractions in Ohio. So this is just basically a list, but you know, you see this circulate every Halloween that Ohio leads the nation in haunted attractions. And this is just haunted houses and like mazes and stuff that doesn't include all the places where you can go do the paranormal investigations or a ghost tour or anything like that. And um, yeah, these are just the entertainment haunted houses. Yes. That are only really available from September to October. Okay. For Halloween season. Cause you know, now it starts September 1st. <laughs> oh, Clover. I'm sorry. My cat is attacking me. Not it really is the shit. first day of Halloween, September first. It, it is. It is. And my black and white cat just scared me. Okay. So for a while now, we have been known as, you know, I think the the post you sent cat, it had 130 in Ohio and everybody else in the country was like 20. Yeah, it, it was <laughs> that was a really low number. <laughs> it was like over 130 haunted house attractions and i did yeah. look at washington i'm like how many does washington have and it was like 32 and i'm like <laughs> oh sure. all right look, they have enough creepy reality out there i don't think they don't need the fake stuff they don't so for me personally i love haunted houses and i have a hard time finding people to go with me because no one likes to be scared but i i do i like to be fake scared i don't want to be real scared you know it's it's the anticipation of it, the buildup of going, the walking in, all of it. And then someone jumps out at you and you scream and you run and sometimes you're chased. And that's a really good cathartic release for me. It's kind of like screaming as you're going down the first hill on a roller coaster. It's the same thing. So if you're a person, though, who throws punches when they're scared or, you know, startled, don't go to a haunted house because you might get arrested for assault. <laughs> so whether it's the monsters or the fake blood, the, the actors dressed in the most fascinating costumes. And even sometimes it's just a person standing in the corner of a dark room. You know, they're there. They know you're there. 
and both of you just wait for the right moment. You see them coming at you, feel a hot breath on your face as they whisper in your ear, and all you can do is run, 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 trying to put them in the darkness behind you. But they follow, and there is nothing but darkness ahead of you. That's what a haunted house is like. So um, sometimes the simplicity is better than all of the blood and guts and gore, because uh, that leaves it up to your imagination. You don't know what's around that corner. And uh, there was one, I don't know if there's still, it was run by cops. It was in Northern Kentucky. Cops are a particular brand of scary just normally, but when they want to scare you on purpose, there's a, a little bit of uh, sadism, sadism in there because they know what they can and cannot do legally. And they would touch you, <laughs> play with your hair. They put these little shock things on the wall so like you know how people hug the walls yeah and you would put your hand out to touch it and then you would get this this small shock and you're like oh okay so you oh, couldn't wow. touch the walls and it was just it was one of the best haunted houses i had been to and it was very low budget didn't have all the the fake monsters and the animatronic monsters and mm -hmm. it was just it was a lot of fun and man did they they loved it have they loved scaring you, you have ever told you my haunted house story uh probably but say tell it again okay since this is okay so some listeners you can just roll your eyes and go oh not again <laughs> so um i get put in the front of groups in haunted houses because i just don't really react to them mm -hmm. i'm just actually judging their costumes and how they did everything <laughs> and yeah. the engineering of the actual house mm -hmm. so i'm i don't get scared because i know how they've built it all yeah no so my friends and this is even in high school um they, they shoved me in front and they had me going and this was a haunted house attraction in niles michigan and it was it's a very popular place um i don't know if it is to this day but i'm gonna assume it is but anyway, um, I was in the front and it was one of those areas where hands are supposed to reach out and like grab your arms and stuff. Mm -hmm. I am a particularly short person and the hand reached out of the wall and got my boob. No. And I just stopped, looked down and I said, sir or ma'am, you have my boob. And the, the person whose hand it was, um, it stopped. It squeezed, <laughs> and then it went back very sheepishly into the hole. And it was another young girl's voice goes, "I'm so sorry." Oh. <laughs> I bet she was horrified. She was horrified. She was. I, I'm standing in this darkened tunnel that has fluorescent paint and a black light and it's strobing and it's supposed to be very fun housey. And I'm just standing there. And if you can just imagine short little cat looking down at the ground going, I just got groped at a haunted house. Oh Mom. no, that's awful. So that is my, and yeah. So I, I used to be always having to go do haunted houses and I've also investigated a haunted house. Oh, yeah, while well, it was all dressed up for Halloween and all that? Yes. So this oh, was cool. an off-season. It was a permanent haunted house attraction in Seymour, Indiana. I don't know if it's still there anymore. And it was located in the airbase where the Tuskegee Airmen actually had a lot of their airplanes. Oh, cool. And back in the day. And now the actual hangar was turned into this haunted house attraction. Oh, wow. And they actually, the owner and several of the staff members had contacted my paranormal group at the time going hey we're seeing like shadow people who are not effects of our show walking around in the staff area oh no so a lot of these haunted houses i'm sorry to bust your story because i no, know we're going to go through fine. all the different ones yeah but so a lot of these haunted house attractions when it's a lot like disneyland where you have all of the actual walk area where the guests are going through and the animatronics and the hidey holes and all the places for the staff. The, and then there's going to be a maze of hidden hallways that are behind everything. And it's done for maintenance. It's where a lot of the breaker boxes are. And uh, it's where the staff can go and move around without the guests actually hearing or seeing them. 
So it's really interesting in that way. It was in these hallways where they were encountering ghosts. Oh. And it was freaking out the staff because they would be dressed up like demons or zombies. And then there would be like a small child looking at them and speaking to them in German. and Or there'll be a, a, a hat man just Ew. standing at the end of the hall. And as you approached him, he got taller. It was nope. just really weird things. And also the animatronics were turning on on their own when the master power was turned off which Whoa. they were just like this no, is no, a safety no, no. issue this is not good and we're like we're not electricians we can't help you with that no. but we will investigate the place at night because that was when it was uh, actually it wasn't even nighttime when we were there we got there at like 3 p.m and investigated the place in broad daylight and then we were there for hours and um we we did get some interesting EVPs and stuff, but one of the spooky bits was we ran into the situation where animatronics that were supposed to be turned off from the master supply for all of them somehow turned on when we were investigating a room. Oh. And there was, like, we were, we did have staff around with us to escort us around to make sure we didn't hurt ourselves, but it wasn't, they, they've looked at the security footage, they couldn't explain how it had turned on. And they went through and they re-flipped all the breakers and everything. And there was a few minutes where we just sat there in this haunted house attraction. And it was just complete darkness. And the one that I was in was oh, with wow. one of the clowns. It was a clown animatronic that had a chainsaw with no tread. So it's going to actually it was. Uh -uh. Do nope. jack. But it was loud. And I'm just uh -huh. sitting there staring at it going, man, I hate those chainsaws. Like, because they're loud. <laughs> But yeah, uh, it would have been spooky if it had turned on on its own without any power. Yeah, I don't mind the chainsaws, but they're normally wielded by someone who can control them. Yes. Yeah. The one, the one that I hate is a swinging lawnmower. Oh like, no! Yeah, that was at the same haunted house attraction, different year that I got groped in, and um, that one was a guy would run right at you, and you are basically standing right where. The, the lawnmower is never going to hit you. It's on wires and it's just going to go right up. But I remember him running at us and it swings up and I look at it and I go, your lawnmower has no blade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that kind of fun person. And oh, that's great. I know now there are haunted houses oh. made for people like me and, mm -hmm. and the stunt staff love trying to scare people like me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it's, you do good work. You take, there's a lot of training and a lot of makeup and a lot of costuming and theatrics yeah. that go on. And I love it. Mm -hmm. I just don't go to them because I'm bored. Sorry, everyone. Cat, and you had to move to Seattle, man. Well, you're only 32. <laughs> now I'm going to get talent. Now I'm going to get emails from people going, I challenge you to go here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be like, hmm. I'm well, sorry. Not, I've witnessed people commit suicide. Nothing in your house is going to scare me. Well, nowadays they have the ones where you sign a waiver and they can do whatever they want to you and you basically tell them when to stop. Oh, yeah, and I just saw something like that in a Cincinnati thing. It's torture. Don't somebody else's yum. If you're into that, yeah. go ahead and do that. I, I don't want to be broken mentally. Thank no, you. I'm not in the mood for that. I only like to be safely scared. I don't like to be real scared scared. Bring me some hot cocoa. Um, exactly. Going That's back to being the first in line, I'm always the first in line. I do not like being in the back because it gives me the creepy crawlies. Because there's always somebody behind you. Yes. I like slowly it. walking towards you. I'll grab you. And then very softly tapping their little <laughs> Or whisper in your ear or pull your hair. Especially if you have long hair. But I had a friend of mine. Uh, we went to Halloween Haunt. And Halloween Haunt at Kings Island is not really scary. Uh, but it's fun. Yeah. And um, it's Scary this, Disney World. This friend I was with, she was scared easily. And she wouldn't look at anything. So she was holding on to my backpack that I had on my back. And anytime someone would come out and scream she would reach forward and just grab my boobs. 
Because she was so scared. I was just like, no. It's okay. It's fine. I understand, but she's like, oh, sorry. <laughs> just like, okay. Yeah, because they're behind, like. Yeah, at least it wasn't a stranger. <laughs> true. Yeah. But. Um, the stranger was apologetic, though. That was not done on purpose. Yeah. I, I feel bad for yeah. her. Um, yeah, you don't want to ass- assault people. Although, no. Some, some unless you sign the waiver, then go for it. Unless you sign the waiver. Yeah. So. Um, sometimes simplicity is better. Like I said, sometimes all the monsters, props, and fake blood is better. But we here in Ohio, we love it all. With that in mind, here is a list of haunted attractions in the state that you may want to attend this Halloween season. First one, Halloween Haunt at Kings Island. Um, it's very, I think it's it can be kid friend, friendly, maybe 12 and up. But um, they recommend it's not for, for young kids. Uh, and, oh, they no. have, and they have multiple mazes they call them mazes multiple mazes you can go through you could spend all night there and not mm-hmm. even go through all of them just because yeah. lines are so long um my personal favorite is the dent school house and we did Ohio, a show on which we did a show on and this one the production value is excellent they have all the blood and gore the makeup the costuming the actors are always good um there is rumor maybe that the actual schoolhouse is haunted um but i do know the story behind it is not true but it's still fun to think of a creepy janitor that you know like to kill children kill kill children (laughs) i don't like to think of that no but we actually have if you want to freak yourself out you know because it's the it's a it's a good urban legend but yeah uh, let me look up what episode that is Okay, yeah, we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, there but, we go. We'll put it in the show notes. But we did this many, many years ago. Yeah. Dent also offers a lights on tour, which is good for people who just want to see the costume or the artwork behind it and how it's all set up and everything. And I think kids can go to that so they're less scared. It's not dark. Um, Land of Illusion in Middletown, Ohio. I have never been, but I've heard that's a good one. USS Nightmare, Newport, Kentucky. It's the one that's on a boat in the Ohio River. It's an old steamboat. Um, I particularly like that one. The I, ambiance is just mwah, chef's yeah. kiss. Uh, originally, I did not like it, but the past couple times I went, I I enjoyed it. I kind of warmed up to it. Not a huge fan of boats. I'm, I'm afraid of drowning. So <laughs> um, well, That adds a layer of terror. Well, it does, especially when the part there's um, water dripping mm-hmm. and you're walking on a graded floor. Didn't like it. <laughs> um, the Akron Haunted House, Haunted Schoolhouse and Laboratory in Akron, Ohio. Uh, Factory of Terror in Canton, Ohio. Blood Prison, which is inside the Mansfield Prison. Uh, the With Ohio Laboratory. The Ohio Reformatory. Sorry, the prison is actually behind it. But it's yeah. it, for those of you who don't know, we've talked about it multiple times, but it's where they film Shawshank Redemption. Mm-hmm. I have never been to this one, but I really would like to go. I will fly back to Ohio and take you there. Well, I've been there, but I just have never done the... Uh, I do the ghost hunt. Done the ghost hunt. I've done mm-hmm. two or three of them. Oh, you mean you haven't been to Blood Prison? To the Haunted House part portion okay. because they, they go through the solitary mm-hmm. confinement area which was just creepy in and of itself let alone like i'd like to hear from the actors that are actually in there all night and I, that's kind yeah of, kind of scary. i had a live audio anomaly while oh. ghost hunting okay the mansfield reformatory in the hole oh yeah yeah you told yeah. me i'd like yeah. to hear that if um you have it <laughs> not right now but, yeah, no, I um, I don't know where I, I would have to look at like three computers back for that yeah. file. Okay, but continue. Let's go to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, fear Columbus, Ohio. Fear Columbus in Columbus, Ohio. The Lewisburg Haunted Cave in Lewisburg, Ohio, which is about thirty miles east or west. I think it's east. That's a typo of Dayton. This is actually in a cave, and it's like 
3,000 um, feet. It's like the long, it's the longest, I think it might, I think it said it was the longest haunted house in the country because it's actually underground in a cave. Oh, and 30,000 bats, apparently. Ooh. Um, Brimstone Haunt, Wilmington, Ohio, and Haunted Town in Lafayette, Ohio. This by no means is a complete list. I didn't just want to copy lists that were already published, but let me tell you my sources. Um, Scarefactor.com, they have an article called 13 Must See Ohio Haunted Houses in 2023. Ohio Cave, the longest haunt in the world with terrors and 30,000 live bats. That is from WLWT.com. Uh, this is also from WLWT, Haunted Attractions, Ultimate Guide to 2023 Scare Season. Um, Heritage, Ohio, 10 Haunted Hotels. We're getting to that. Ohio State Reformatory website. Um, haunted Ohio, 9 Must Visit Places, um, Ohio.org, and the Franklin Castle, which is in Cleveland. So, Oh, yeah, the Franklin Castle. Oh my gosh, that place looks so cool. I, I want to go there too. I sit there smiling like I live there. I'm like, oh yeah, it's a good friend of mine, the Franklin Castle. Well, I'm sure you've heard of it. Have you ever been? <laughs> Have you I've ever been, been to it? it no. Okay, so if the fake scares and the fake blood and the guts aren't for you and the real thing is more your speed, Ohio also offers a plethora of haunted hotels, tours, and ghost hunts. Uh, these offer a different kind of spook, ghost stories associated with old hotels, homes, farms, or stories that are possibly true. Most of the time, they're based on actual facts of actual people who lived in those places and died in those places. The possibility of seeing a real ghost or capturing one on video, a sound recording, or a photo is, the thr is a thrill in and of itself. And it's also kind of fun just to go into the historic historical buildings and let your imagination run wild and... Just generally freak yourself out, which is something I also do mm -hmm. <laughs> in those. But uh, the, even if you don't believe in this stuff, it is still fun to go just to see and kind of get that behind the scenes tour of the actual place. Because oftentimes they just let you roam around mm -hmm. with the lights off and it's just they're cool, especially if you like urban decay, because a lot of these buildings are not um, fixed up or they're trying to be in the process of fixing fixing them up and that's why have, they have these events to fund yeah. that yeah there's a lot of insurance is, is expensive for all of them yes so yes um especially when they're yeah creepy old prisons yeah when <laughs> mansfield always said or the reformatory always said do not lock shut the doors in the cells you no. do not have keys. You will be locked in there. <laughs> yes. So if you ever go, you can go in the cells. Just don't shut the door. Yeah, don't don't actually shut the doors. I would not suggest that in any of the building in any of the rooms. <laughs> so here is a list of places you can go in search of a real ghost. Please note that most of these places you can visit any time of the year. They are not partic particularly. Uh, uh, events done only around Halloween. Um, if they are an event, it will be noted. So, the Penderson Manor in Newberry, Ohio. The towers, uh, the tower streets are where the activity is, and apparently, a lumberjack hanging by a rope is the creepiest reported sighting here. Uh, the Park Hotel in Putten Bay, Ohio. Activity is said to be seen all around the hotel. The barroom lobby, rooms fourteen and seventeen, are places of reported sights by guests. The park, oh no, I just said that. Writers in the Writers Inn in Painesville, Ohio, uh, civil and revolutionary soldiers, as well as the former mistress of the house, Suzanne Ryder, is said to be seen here. It's said that once Suzanne greeted guests in the door at the door and actually let them inside. <laughs> I've actually stayed there. I have oh. a ghost story. Okay. Okay, let me finish this and then I want to hear it. Sure. Okay. A Georgian Manor bed and breakfast in Logan, Ohio. A man and children wearing period clothing are said to be seen on the front lawn. Um, and Ohio State Reformatory, Mansfield, Ohio, offer, 
offers public ghost hunts, private paranormal investigations for adults 18 and older, which is about $100 a person. Uh, ghost walks are offered for those 13 years and older. They also offer self-guided and guided tours throughout the year. And then last, Franklin Castle in Cleveland, a woman in black, crying babies, and for flickering lights are a few of the ghostly things reported here. Tours are offered year round and if you dare, an overnight stay. I'd love to go to Franklin Castle. Oh yeah, it sounds fun. fun. I, I looked I looked at their website and uh, a lot of it, of course, everything through this season is already sold out. Oh yeah, so, oh, of course. Yeah. Well, Franklin Castle was closed for so long too, so that helped add to the mystery of the area oh, their, so. their website's cool they totally play in it's kind of like dent how they play into the story and the myth around mm -hmm. it yeah and um but they do have stuff in december january february march that is not mm -hmm. sold out so maybe so. we should try to stay at a hotel a haunted hotel that'd be a awesome visit for a loveland frogman yes oh yeah okay we can talk yeah. about that we we'll try to get something together for march yeah so i mean there's always golden lamb Yes, He's Golden never, Lamp, yeah. not that far away. And I've actually never been to it. So it'd be fun. I've seen go. the outside. I oh, yeah, I've been, been there a bunch it. of times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, then we, we switched there. We so, did an episode on that, too. Yeah, we yeah, did. Yeah, that, that was a few seasons ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Writers in. So when you mentioned this, I was like, I know Painesville. My family is historically from Painesville. Okay. So um, it was the first place where the family moved from Connecticut. Anyway. So Writer's Inn is a super historic, and it is one of the first stagecoach inns in the entire state. Oh, wow. And I went and visited there for and, and, and uh, interviewed a lot of the employees, staffs, and the owner when I was writing Ohio's Haunted Crime, because okay. the murder of Suzanne Ryder is included in that book. It's okay. one of my favorite chapters of the entire book. It was a joy to research and stay there. And I do have a ghost story with Suzanne. So Suzanne, Writer's Inn, as it is, was built in 1814, which is why it's one of the oldest stagecoach inns. The place where I stayed in was, I think it's called the Pink Room. Everything, there's a lot of Paisley, no matter where you're at in that place. Um, it is a wonder to go there. And Suki, if she's still there, she is the family dog and she will Aww. greet you. And Aww. and she's adorable. She was an Australian Shepherd when. <laughs> this sounds Aww. conditional. She was an Australian Shepherd when I visited her. She could be something different when you do. Yeah, I don't know. Her. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> conditional changing of a dog. <laughs> but at any rate, so uh, I was there back in 2013, and uh, we stayed the night there. And the night it was a dark and stormy night in July. So if you've never been to Painesville, it's along the Erie, Lake Erie. And because of where it sits during the summer months, you can have ca catastrophically large thunderstorms develop very quickly over the town, which is what happened that night. So it was clear when we arrived and two hours later, we had massive thunderstorms shaking of the house or the building because of the thunderclaps and lightning everywhere. So this is where we're trying to fall asleep and uh, in this particular in environment. And I'm laying in bed, staring at the ceiling and lightning is flashing through the blinds and something grabbed my foot. Yeah. Like, not, I knew it wasn't Mike, it wasn't me, and it wasn't anyone at the end of the bed that I could visually see, but I could feel a cold, clampy hand clamp around my left ankle and I could feel every single bone in the hand as it Ew. grabbed on no. and it was icy cold and no. clammy and I my only reaction was and I couldn't see anything because I didn't have my glasses or contacts in and so <laughs> I'm everything's super fuzzy if I'm not wearing corrective eyewear and all I could say was Suzanne please let go of my leg. And immediately it let go. Huh. And she's a very friendly spirit. Yeah. This was just a strangely intimidating way to say hello to someone. Yeah. But I guess she didn't want to shake my hand because I was already in bed and my foot was sticking out. But 
it was July in Is hot and humid. Messing with you or? Yeah, it could be. She's she could be messing with me. Um, she's a wonderful entity who has saved the building multiple times. Yes, now I remember you telling us the story. Yeah. Yes. Um, she saved in one incident. Uh, she saved the hotel by, I think in this case it was the furnace was malfunctioning while there were people staying there and someone she she opened the front door stood out on the porch and this is from memory and two police officers happened to be driving by around three in the morning and seeing her standing there wondered what was happening and went to go investigate the door was left open and then they discovered the issue with the furnace oh, wow another time the bro the boiler malfunctioned sending the basement into a flood and somebody kept lighting candles around the building which is a big no-no because it's a timber frame building oh, yeah. and the groundskeeper kept going around extinguishing all these candles and discovered the boiler had broken and was flooding wow. the basement. and then a third time she let a newlywed couple in she greeted them at the door in her night clothes and let the and they they she opened the door they said thank you i'm sorry we're arriving so late she just pointed up to the staircase they went up the stairs and then she disappeared and then the next day when the manager came and went because you get breakfast when you're there they're like how did you get in and they're like oh we arrived at like two in the morning and your night manager must have let us in and they're <laughs> like please describe the night manager oh and because there isn't one and oh. um they described Suzanne <laughs> in her night clothes from the early 1800s. Oh so God. she's she's a character. I love her a lot. She's one of my favorite Buckeye haunts. Seems like a nice ghost, man. She, she is. Please go visit house Riders with in. People. But yeah. she didn't bother Mike. She just grabbed your leg. Just grabbed me. So, you know. You know, I'd like to think if. If I'm going to haunt anything, I am definitely going to mess with people. And I'm going to mess with the people that it's going to scare the most. Yep, don't I believe? So you're going the full <laughs> Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> full Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah. I love that. If, yeah. if, I'm really hoping it's true because then death isn't so scary. <laughs> yeah. You can yeah, you just and dress off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh. That's well, gonna that be a lot of my head. I'm going yeah. full Beetlejuice when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, oh. yeah. Go to a haunted house or a haunted hotel and see what you find. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of people just don't like to be startled. Yeah. And I get that. Like Chris Christine is one of them. She's like, oh no, I will scare people. I'll be an actor and scare people, but I'm not walking through there as soon as someone jumps at me. I'm punching them in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a oh, it's man. a natural reaction, you know. It really is. Yourself. I guess I just don't have that. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Yeah, but I don't know what I would do if it were real. So you kind of just a lot of people don't realize what they see is not actually supposed to be there until they yeah. put everything together a little bit later or talk to someone yeah. like James did with his story at Waverly. Yeah. Um, it was very, it's very rare when we have like when we were at An the Anchorage last year where we we're just sitting around and we got a disembodied voice. Yeah, that was, that's weird. extremely rare. And I'm actually kind of pleased that you all got to experience that. Mm -hmm. the, that was a fun night that was a fun night i miss doing our ghost hunts so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try to plan something in march yes so, definitely definitely yeah like a field right, trip was yeah so all right i think i think we're winding down this episode yes so, yeah so everyone thank you for joining us for another wonderful episode of the hometown haunts podcast i am kat cloco we have christina wald and jen kohler you can send us your haunted history encounters or paranormal encounters. There we go. And fringe history to uh, from your neck of the woods to hometown haunted mail at gmail.com or join our Facebook group, hometown haunts to share all of your stories and hear Excellent. others from other listeners. Uh, you can also find us at Cincy, Cincy captain of curiosities on Instagram and for all of us, to you, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay spooky. 
Yes. Bye. Bye.